summary. She's not a set or reproduction. She is the summary. And that was captured on June 4th, 1944, by Captain Daniel Gallery at his Hunter Killer Task Force 2243. She is one of five Evo's in the world today. She is the only class 19 in the world. She's also the only Evo in history during combat by the American Navy. So I'm very excited to be able to share the piece of history with you guys today. Now she's about 252 feet long. She's 31 feet high from the bottom of the keel to the top of the conning tower. At the widest point, she is 22 feet. However, as soon as you get rid of the ballast tanks, the widest point is only 15 feet on the interior. So get excited, especially you guys. We're great to her. Uh, right now, she's about 693 tons. However, if she were fully loaded and eventually poured, she would have weighed 1112 tons. Now, this is with the addition of men, food, fuel, water, torpedoes. One torpedo alone weighs 3,000 pounds. And they would bring between 18 and 22 of them for each patrol. There's just some extra weight. Uh, now I do have just some guidelines to go for it. Actually, I'm on board. Do you guys have any loose articles on you? Anything that can fall to the ground, please make sure they are secure. But if anything falls to where I cannot reach it, then you just made a permanent donation to the museum. Thank you, but it does happen. Now for those of you that are five foot seven or taller, you are not meant to serve on the submarines. Please watch your heads. They're only very low ceilings and high points that go around and look not too bad. You're gonna love it, you're uh, We're also gonna be on a light and sound guided tour today. So any questions that you guys might think of around the door? Awesome! Just hold on to them until the very end, and I'll make sure to answer for you guys. And take all the pictures you guys want. The one thing I ask, so when the lights go out, no flash photography, because I will get blinded and confused. Oh my god. I'm really something you want to see. Uh, also, if you are taking pictures, I ask you guys just keep up with one another because we will all be on a timer today and I just want to make sure that the tour at least ends with me for everyone. <laughs> now with all that said, are you guys ready to go for it? Yeah! Yes, let's go! a little squish having just 13 of us in here. This submarine was built for 46 to 48 men. However, by her last patrol, she had 59 men serving on her crew. Now, this might have been enough space if the museum had made some alterations to this room. We actually lowered the floor about a foot. The original height would be where I am standing. Also, that ledge back there. We also removed six bunks that were lining this wall. They extended about where this railing is. So that means the museum put in this entrance and the exit. The original way in and out of the U-505 would only be through the conning tower, and that's located in the control room. Unfortunately, being crammed is not the only thing these sailors have to worry about. When they were captured, they were captured 150 miles west of the coast of Africa. So this room that we're in right now was the coolest room on board at 95 degrees. The hottest room on board would be in the diesel engine room, and that range about 110 to 120 degrees. Now, normally you can take a shower if you're dealing with that kind of heat. However, these men could only bring a very limited amount of fresh water on board, so they had enough to use for cooking, for drinking, the rest of the water. How do we put on top of these electric batteries or even make feet? If you have salt water mixed with a lead acid battery, it makes a chlorine gas. Not the best thing to breathe in as a member of the crew. So that leaves out showering, that leaves out laundry. I think it's even worse than that. They would bring about 12 tons of food on board to feed everyone for about 90 to 100 days. That's a lot of food, so they'd have it hanging from the pipes that had to be shoved on the bunks. They had so much food that they had to store it in one of two heads or bathrooms that were on board. It would take them in about six weeks to actually eat their way to their second bathroom. And it gets even worse than that. For 59 men, they have only 35 bunks on board. Now, most of the men that slept in here, the petty officers, they had it pretty nice because, well, they got their own bunks. But for the enlisted men that slept in the forward and aft computer rooms, they had to practice something called hot bunking or hot racking. Now, as soon as a man got off duty, he would go to one of the torpedo rooms and he would peel the sleeping man out of his sweaty filth and jump into those sometimes lice 
infested sweaty sheets and try to get some sleep. They don't worry guys. <laughs> they did have a couple luxuries on board. They had a radio and they had a record player. This is an actual French recording that was found on the U505 after her capture. So we're gonna take a second to listen to one of the nice things about being on board. Don't worry, they're over 80 pounds. Now obviously this was not a pleasure cruise for the men. U-boats were designed for one thing only, and that was to destroy Allied ships. As soon as the U-boat found her target, she would close in more and more until night fell. As soon as night fell, the captain would order a dive or to submerge a submarine. To do this though, he would have to sound the dive bells. This meant every man had to report to their dive stations. So they would have to open up the vents and flood the ballast tanks. The men would take her to about 30 feet under the surface, otherwise known as periscope depth. March 5th, 1942, the U-505 would find her first target. It was the British freighter, the Ben Moore. So as they're submerging the water, they use their periscopes to keep an eye on their target as they close it even more. Soon, the crew will start figuring out all the coordinates, where their torpedoes are going to go, how long it's going to take to get there. Four torpedoes were released from a four torpedo room, two from the aft torpedo room. You can actually hear the crew figuring out all these coordinates right now. The only thing we have left to do is to wait for the captain to tell his crew to fire. Lows were away in German. And the crew used stopwatches to literally count the seconds it took for the torpedoes to reach their target. Silence meant to miss and possibly giving away their location. However, an explosion that meant to hit. Right now you can actually hear the hull of the Benmore cracking under the pressures of the ocean as she falls down to the ocean floor. For the crew of the Benmore, their luck had just run out. But for the crew of the U-505, their luck had just begun just two days later on March 7th, 1942. It'd be the Norwegian merchant vessel, the Sidov. Then about a month later, on April 3rd, the American West Irmo. Four more ships would fall to these torpedoes. One would fall to deck gun. This was by no means a record in the war, but still obviously very, very deadly. So we're going to begin our story of the capture of the U-505 in the control room. But we're passing through the rooms first, so I don't want you guys to be an eye for. The first one is the galley, or the kitchen. After that will be the general officer's quarters. The near pass room is on your left. The first one is the sound room. Next to that will be the radio room, where the two famous Enigma machines were found on board. On your right will be a solitary bunk. That is going to be the captain's quarters. Now, the last captain of the U-505, Captain Harold Langa, he was about 6'2". So I got room two, stay to the right of the right for me. We've got 60 seconds to begin short room. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, if you guys look right over here to the periscope silo, you're going to see these silver tubes. So 
So these are called the speaking tubes. This is actually how the crew would communicate to different compartments in the boat. It was great because you didn't need power to use them. It was kind of like two tin cans with a string in between. You just have your sound waves traveling in the pipes. They were very, very loud though. They're located right next to the diesel engine room. So if they have to make more quiet conversations, they do have telephones on board too. Now if you look right on over here to these two steering wheels, this would be the planesman station. So they control the dive planes or the surfacing and submerging of the boat. The crew wouldn't often use the steering wheels though, that's just the manual override. What they would actually do, they would hold onto the black handles and push down and that's what's going to move the angle of your dive planes. Now right behind you sir, there's a gray box labeled BBC, that would be the helmsman station. So they control the rudders or the steering of the boat. You'll notice there is not a steering wheel over there, that actually becomes really important in our story. Uh, and then this ladder leads up to the conning tower. This is the main way in and out of the U505 originally. Your attack and navigation periscopes would be up here also. So we're leading up to the days of June 4th, 1944. Captain Longa and his crew spot the American Navy off in the distance. So the captain orders a crash dive. Now crash dive is when every man not on duty has to crash the board carbons in order to fully submerge her faster. Now if everything was done correctly, she could be fully submerged in a mere 37 seconds. They'd also have to disengage their diesel engines to switch over to their electric motors, their electric batteries, because the diesel engines suck up all the oxygen in the water. Now Captain Longa knew they were being hunted, so they wanted to stay submerged for as long as possible. But these submarines can only stay submerged for a limited amount of time. The battery is going to last up to 36 hours. So in order to conserve that battery power, the men had to turn off all unnecessary functions, even all unnecessary lights, except for some very important gauges that you can see in the control room. Now the crew knew that sound conducted better in water than it did in air. So if someone on the crew had dropped a wrench, that wrench could be heard from miles away. They wanted to conserve oxygen too, so every man not on duty was sent to bed. Because a sleeping man consumes less oxygen than an awake man. Now these sound heroes right now, those would be the pings of sonar. Captain Daniel Gallery will use sonar to try and close in on the U-505. For two long days, the crew could hear these pings of sonar growing louder and even louder. So in order to try and maneuver the hunter-killer task force, the captain gave the order to dive down deeper. He gave the order to dive down to 500 feet below the surface. This was getting dangerously close to her crush depth. The submarine could feel 16 tons of pressure per square foot at this depth. You can actually hear the pressure building on her sides. Now, the worst thing they could hear at this depth were splashes. Splashes would mean depth charges, and depth charges would mean that they were found and about to experience an attack. By this point, the crew could only hold on to something. So as the men are being thrown across the room, they can feel 600 pounds of demolition in the sides of the submarine. Soon, the power would go out, the rudders jammed to starboard, and she would begin an uncontrollable dive down to the ocean bottom. Now, Captain Longa knew if him and his men were to ever see daylight again, he'd have to give the order to surface the boat and risk being captured. And he did just that. They had to blow the ballast tanks and bring her up to air. As soon as she reached the surface, Captain Longa climbed this exact ladder to go meet Captain Daniel Gallery and his Hunter Killer Task Force. He was met with planes flying overhead and six minutes of gunfire. The captain will be wounded during this process. He got hit in the knee by a piece of shrapnel. Later, he gets his leg removed. 
There'd only be one casualty in the U505 crew, and that would be the radio man, Godfrey Fisher. Now the captain gave one more order to his men before they fully surrendered, and that was to scuttle the boat. Or to forcibly sink her. So the credit set 14 demolition charges that were located throughout the submarine. However, when the American boarding party of nine men came on board, they could only find 13 of the 14 demolition charges. One was to remaining. They also need to gain control of the rudders, and they knew the manual steering wheel had to be in the aft torpedo room. But for some reason, that hatchman sealed shut. And they didn't know why. So we're going to continue our story in the electric motor room, but right before I see this room, on the floor of the left, there is something called the sea strainer. I'll explain that further as soon as we get into the electric motor room. So we have our two, stay to the right for me. We'll go ahead and make our way. So this guy right here, this is called the sea strainer, and this is what the lid looks like to it, so keep that all in mind. <clears throat> to the ocean water, so you constantly have water flowing through, and then goes through the strainer, which acts a lot like a pool filter, which then leads to a series of pipes that cool down the equipment on board. So it was an absolutely brilliant idea in order to sink the submarine. However, the German sailor that took the lid off did not take the lid with him to throw overboard and left it right next to the sea strainer itself. So when the American boarding party came on board, then and Lakotius instantly found the sea strainer and the lid, replaced it back on, and that is why we have the U505 today, which is pretty cool. Now, you guys just passed the diesel engine room. That was an actual recording of just one of the diesel engines, but running on idle. So you can only imagine how deafening the sound must have been with them going full throttle. Now, they'd use these two nine-cylinder diesel engines on the surface of the water. They could run at about 18 knots, or 21 miles per hour. When they were submerged, they would switch their electric motors, which you guys can see on the right left of the floor, and those guys could run at about seven knots, or eight miles per hour. So we're getting back to our story. Now the boarding party knows the manual steering wheel has to be behind this hatch. But why did the German crew just steal off this one compartment? Was there flooding? Was there a booby trap? They had no idea. Now Captain Daniel Gallery believed that he would not give his men an order that he himself would not do. So he sent the entire boarding party out of the room, shut the door, walked up to the hatch, most likely felt around for some wires. Took all the handle, and by this point, we have to take a very deep breath, and nothing happened, which is the best thing that could have happened. If you guys can see the inside of this hatch door, it's glowing. The Germans used phosphorescent paint to paint very important things located throughout the submarine, in case the power to ever go out, such as in this case. So pipelines were painted, Gauges. Even the backs of the torpedo hatches were painted with it. It's very similar to the gold that our stars you guys might have had on your ceilings. And the boarding party did find the 14th demolition charge in this room, but just like all the other demolition charges, it had not been set by the crew. They also found the manual steering wheel behind here, and they're able to gain control of the rudders, eventually towed to Bermuda. You'll see some of the bunks we enlisted men. Your second head, or toilet, would also be behind here, towards the left. Now, the boarding party found two very important things in this room. They found two T5 acoustic torpedoes. This is something the crew had never seen before. These torpedoes could actually hold man on the side of a ship's engine and go straight for her. Now let's go through deadly to a submarine though, because they got too close to their target. Torpedoes will just wrap around and go straight for them. The boarding party also found 900 pounds of classified documents on board, so you can see why the German crew really wanted to sink the U-505. 
Now it's believed with all these classified documents, the two acoustic torpedoes and the two Enigma machines that were found on board, it's believed that the war was ended months in advance, possibly saving thousands of lives. So in just a second, you guys, you able to walk up and look at the hatch. I just ask you guys, do not step inside it. It's the original flooring. But you guys can put your heads as much as you want. I just keep in mind that we do have a tour right behind us. Any questions you guys might have, I'll be right outside and happy to answer them for you. Otherwise, thank you guys for coming on this tour today. <clears throat> yeah, I'm gonna stick down. You guys can get Thank you. I was gonna ask her how we get out. <laughs> Take some video and then jump right out of your way. Excuse me.